and uh, turn it over to Anna to talk about Jupiter Lab. Um, hello, everyone. I guess uh, it should be audible for you, all of you. Um, just let me share my screen. <clears throat> so again, hello everyone, I'm Anoop. I work with Freiburg Galaxy team in, uh, uh, in Freiburg, Germany, and I uh, work in the Freiburg Galaxy team. So, um, <clears throat> so today we'll uh, discuss about um, a special Jupiter lab that uh, we have de developed as a Galaxy interactive tool, and that's uh, dedicated for developing AI programs. So to develop that, um, I mean, before discussing um, into the details, um, we already know, uh, or many of us uh, may have used Jupyter Lab or Jupyter Notebooks for prototyping uh, different projects, uh, creating visualizations. I mean, in general, uh, it's a popular editor for scientific computing and data science projects. It's also uh, very popular for developing uh, machine learning and deep learning programs. Also, it can be all useful for, for learning Python, for example. And Jupyter Notebooks, uh, uh, they support lots of different programming languages like Python and R. So uh, it provides a simple and easy way to create uh, such prototypes. And um, people and researchers and users uh, who are using these kind of uh, notebooks, they do not uh, deal with lots of package installations. I mean, many, many uh, popular packages are already installed there. These notebooks uh, can be easily shared with someone. It can be committed along with the results and then can be easily shared with someone else. And uh, one of the most important features is uh, it can be made to run on web, which makes it even better to, to share this kind of analysis. Uh, you can just share a link and then the exact analysis will be available to someone else. To develop this project, um, we have customized a Docker container. There are lots of Docker containers available uh, that, uh, that has Jupyter notebooks already uh, prepackaged in the container. One such uh, kind of Docker container is Jupyter Docker stacks. And we have used uh, this one of these stacks uh, that, is, that, has all, that already has TensorFlow installed as a base container. On top of the base container, we have added lots of packages. For example, uh, I mean, Jupyter Lab, uh, which is a better version of Jupyter Notebooks. Then uh, we have other packages such as scikit-learn, TensorFlow. Uh, we'll soon install PyTorch as well. Then uh, it has a support for GPU computation as well. If uh, <clears throat> the hosted machine has uh, NVIDIA GPUs, then uh, this notebook can access to the GPUs via CUDA packages that we have already made available in this container. Then we have uh, another package called Elira AI. Using the Elira AI, we can create a workflow of notebooks and then uh, entire analysis can be executed as a workflow in one unit of software. Then there are other features such as Git integration. Uh, we can directly clone a GitHub repository inside the notebook and then uh, <clears throat> entire repository can be used uh, this customized Docker container is then pulled by uh, Galaxy's interactive tool. There are lots of uh, other interactive tools available in Galaxy, uh, such as there is one uh, for Jupyter, Jupyter Notebook, I think, and there are lot, lots of others. This interactive tool pulls uh, the Docker container and then creates the entire ecosystem and then it provides a link. And using that link, uh, Jupyter Lab can be opened and uh, lots of uh, different, uh, I mean, features can be used inside, uh, inside notebooks. Um, <clears throat> in this uh, slide uh, on the right, uh, we have the architecture diagram of the entire project. So we have a Docker container here that uh, we have customized. And it has lots of packages that we have added, for example, CUDA packages, TensorFlow, and uh, OpenONNX uh, is uh, one model sharing 
package. Um, <clears throat> machine learning field generally suffers from uh, model sharing problems. Uh, for example, TensorFlow creates models in binary files and there are lots of binary files inside and it's very hard to share those files with anyone. Therefore, um, with ONNX format, uh, these entire models can be converted to one, one file and can be shared with anyone and can also be used for inference or predictions. There is another feature in our Docker container is remote model training. We have used Galaxy and we know um, how we run jobs in Galaxy. Um, we have used a similar methodology uh, for doing a remote training that can be started from the Jupyter Lab notebook. This Docker container uh, takes some packages from the base container, which is uh, Jupyter slash notebook, TensorFlow notebook. And uh, it already has uh, Jupyter Lab installed. And uh, when we run this container, uh, it automatically opens a uh, Jupyter Lab. And we have added several other packages uh, to make it also work with Galaxy. Then this uh, customized container is pulled by a uh, Jupyter Interactive Tool. And uh, Jupyter Interactive Tool uh, uh, runs on Galaxy's uh, compute clusters. Alternatively, uh, this custom container can also be used on other compute infrastructures, uh, which has lots of CPUs or GPUs or even TPUs, for example. Uh, therefore, it's kind of a, a, a general, uh, a general container, which can be used uh, in on different compute infrastructures. With Galaxy Interactive Tool, uh, <clears throat> it opens the, the notebook and it looks like this. That contains lots of uh, different features. For example, um, we discussed uh, it has CUDA packages. So if the compute infrastructure has GPUs, NVIDIA GPUs, then um, we can uh, uh, leverage our programs on these GPUs and our model execution and training would be faster. Then it has lots of uh, popular packages for machine learning, uh, scikit-learn, for example, and TensorFlow, then uh, computer vision packages. Then we have uh, for data manipulation, uh, pandas, and uh, for saving matrices, we have H5, H5PY, and then uh, for interacting with images, then there is NI Babel package. Um, <clears throat> there are lots of visual, visualization packages as well. For example, uh, the popular ones are Matplotlib, Seaborn, and Voila. Then uh, Git integration and uh, ONNX models we have uh, discussed already, um, as well as Elira AI. We have also installed a BioBlend uh, in the container, and uh, it helps the notebook to interact with Galaxy. And we can access from the notebook, we can access Galaxy's histories, we can create histories and uh, interact with data sets and workflows. This BioBlend package is um, internally used for, for remote training to make it possible. Uh, <clears throat> and it also uses a separate Galaxy tool. We will uh, see how we can do remote model training uh, in, in the later slides. There are lots of small features, for example, IntelliSense is there. If we put a dot in front of a package, then it shows all the available methods inside. And uh, there are lots of dashboards for monitoring the resources. For example, we can see uh, on the right um, how much percentage of CPUs are being used and how much memory is being used and uh, <clears throat> so on. This is how it looks uh, when we run um, this interactive tool, then it opens a Jupyter Lab container. And then uh, we have already created a few example notebooks. For example, uh, this is the homepage and this um, gives the uh, brief introduction to all the features. And they are inside notebooks and there are lots of other uh, notebooks available that showcases different features. Uh, we, will, we will see that uh, in, in live. How does it compare with uh, other notebook infrastructures? Uh, for example, and there are two popular notebook infrastructures. Uh, one is Google Colab, and the second one is Cali Kernels. These two are very popular for, I mean, they also, uh, they're also available online. 
and uh, people use it a lot uh, for developing AI programs. And they provide uh, different kinds of features. Uh, let's see uh, and compare how does our infrastructure, that is VLAN Galaxy Jupyter Lab, how does it compare with other popular infrastructures? In terms of memory and disk space, um, <clears throat> Google, uh, Google Scholab and Kaggle Kernel, uh, they are uh, not that great. Uh, also, um, their disk space is also not high. Uh, I mean, 70 gigabytes, uh, if you deal with uh, lots of images, I mean, millions of images, then it will be pretty, pretty small uh, disk space. And the memory is also not that high. Also, these memory and disk space, these are also dynamic. Uh, so <clears throat> they, uh, we understand that they are, they are big companies and uh, they have lots of uh, infrastructure, lots of GPUs and TPUs available uh, with them. But uh, to make it fair for, for everyone, um, people who use more, they get less resources. And people who use less, they get more resources. So that's how they want to make their system and infrastructures more and more fairer to everyone. Therefore, um, uh, many times I have used it and uh, they give around 70 gigabytes of disk space, um, but sometimes it's also higher, as high as 100 gigabytes as well. But our Jupyter Lab uh, gives like one terabyte of space and uh, it's, it's quite big. And uh, the CPU memory, uh, CPU uh, is around 20 gigabytes. And I think there are 20 virtual CPUs, I guess. Um, in terms of GPU and TPU availability, um, both these uh, Colab and kernels, they have both the GPUs and TPUs available. But uh, currently, we have only GPUs, and TPUs are not available. Um, TPUs are slightly uh, better compared to GPUs. Um, and it's, it was developed by Google, but now I guess it's open source, it's open. And uh, TPUs are specially designed uh, for processing tensors and uh, specially designed for, for creating and training uh, neural networks and especially customized for TensorFlow. Um, <clears throat> So currently we do not have TPUs available, but uh, GPU, yes. Um, let's also discuss the maximum usage time. Uh, for example, if you're using Google Cola, then um, we can use it for 12 hours. We create a session that gives us uh, a connection to a remote virtual machine, and it's available only for 12 hours. After 12 hours, it gets killed. Uh, Cal kernels are a little bit better. Um, I mean, they give 30 hours of GPU a week, which is also not that great, and uh, also 20 hours of TPU. Um, if we demand higher resources, then uh, the usage time uh, becomes less and less. In our infrastructure, there is no time restriction. Um, we can use it for days or even months and uh, use and block the GPU for a long time uh, for job execution and creating uh, or training uh, models uh, that take many days of training. Our resources that we give, they are fixed and guaranteed. Uh, they do not change based on the usage, but uh, Google Colab and Kaggle kernels, uh, their resources are dynamic. They change uh, based on the usage pattern of a user. In addition, uh, these two infrastructures, uh, they do not provide uh, any any technique for remote model training, uh, they have to go through um, to the through the uh, notebook. Uh, it's not like we close the notebook and the, the results would be available to us. For us, it's true. Um, we can start um, or we can call a function and that will take the entire training and model creation to Galaxy, and the notebook uh, can be safely closed, and it's totally decoupled from the notebook. And the models will be available uh, like any data set in Galaxy. Um, <clears throat> to showcase the power of this infrastructure, so we have uh, reproduced results from two recent papers. First one is uh, related to the CT scan uh, image segmentation. In these, um, we have lots of CT scans available. And these CT scans come from infected people. And uh, they have certain areas marked where 
inside the CD scans, uh, which region is actually in infected. So the unit model, the unit neural network, uh, this learns uh, which regions uh, in the entire CT scan is infected. And it predicts that region. Uh, if we give uh, a CT scan, then it predicts uh, which regions are actually infected. So this entire uh, paper can be reproduced uh, in our infrastructure. Uh, give and uh, similar accuracy uh, can be can be attained. Um, so this can be run in two ways: the entire anal analysis in Jupyter notebooks, and uh, in alternatively, um, a remote model training feature can also be used. And uh, that takes uh, uh, either CPU that runs on CPU or GPU, and uh, the models can be created in Galaxy History. These models can again be uh, pulled into, into notebooks using BioBlend, and then uh, predictions can be made. For remote training, we need to convert the data sets to uh, H5. Um, in general, uh, in, in general uh, all these neural networks and uh, machine learning algorithms, they take input data as, as matrices. And uh, since we know that uh, machine learning and deep learning algorithms uh, work on wide variety of data sets from sequences uh, to images uh, to gene expression patterns. So <clears throat> therefore to, to make it uh, kind of a standard um, so that uh, we can send the data to Galaxy, therefore all the data sets uh, that uh, we want to train a neural network on, they should be converted to, to H5 uh, for remote model training so that we can uh, re upload these H5, either one file or multiple files from the notebook by running a function. We will uh, see that uh, technique uh, uh, in a couple of slides. And then uh, the entire analysis can be executed. We save our train model as ONNX file. And uh, this is uh, one file and which can be used uh, for making uh, inferences on unseen data sets. Um, <clears throat> so uh, in the slide, uh, we have two images, uh, one on the left, one on the right. On the left, uh, we can see here the CT scans uh, and the chest uh, CT scans. And uh, in, the, in the middle row, sorry, uh, in the middle row, uh, we have uh, the infected regions uh, denoted in, in, in red. And from these infected regions, uh, we compute these masks. And these masks are actually uh, uh, an example uh, where these infected regions lie uh, in relation to the CT scan, original CT scan. Therefore, uh, this image and uh, this image, they make one training pair. This is the image and this is the label of that image. And this is, uh, we want to predict when we have a model, then uh, we supply one CT scan, and then our model will predict uh, which region from this CT scan is actually infected. <clears throat> so in our notebooks, uh, we could uh, train our models, and then uh, we could produce uh, this kind of image. On the leftmost column, we can see the original CT scans. And uh, in the second column, we see the ground truth masks which are the uh, true masks or the true infected regions uh, from these CD images. Then <clears throat> there are two error functions that were used in the paper and uh, they produced a, a similar uh, output compared to the ground mask. For example, if you compare uh, this image with this image, they are quite, quite similar. Uh, obviously they are not same. And uh, <clears throat> The, the error function uh, that was used uh, in the last column, which is BCE stands for binary cross entropy and uh, TV stands for total variation. This produced uh, better results as per the paper. And uh, this entire analysis was possible um, in our infrastructure, in our notebook infrastructure. So uh, only one thing that was different is uh, we have to convert all the images um, uh, to H5 files. And these H5 files, uh, they contain several data sets, uh, training and uh, training data sets and uh, validation and test data sets. 
and <clears throat> these uh, these were uploaded uh, to to Galaxy uh, in the notebook, and then was used accordingly. And uh, the code that they uh, the authors uh, shared, so we had to modify the code a little bit. Uh, we did not um, modify anything in the neural network or the loss functions, anything, uh, just how the input data is passed to the neural network. Um, <clears throat> uh, the, the second way, uh, yeah. the second way how we can um, do such kind of an uh, analysis while uh, training our models remotely First, uh, we need to create a script, uh, the entire analysis in one script. This script will be executed uh, by a custom function that we made part of the notebook itself. This is a run script job. This is part of the notebook itself. Uh, we just write a run script job and then uh, and pass the correct parameters and then it uh, runs a tool. This tool is a Galaxy tool. And this is hidden, uh, it is not available in a Galaxy search. And uh, <clears throat> there, are, there are a few parameters to this function. Um, first one is the path to the script that is executed. So first we create the entire analysis, one notebook file, and then supply its path. Uh, this path is related to the notebook. For example, in the notebook, we create a, a data folder, then uh, the path to the script with data slash uh, the script. Then we need to uh, specify the list of data sets used in, the, uh, in this notebook. In this notebook, we may have used uh, lots of different uh, H5 files. So these H5 files, the, the relative path should be given as a list uh, to this function. And then um, we are using BioBlend. Therefore, uh, we need to give um, the URL which Galaxy server it needs to run on and then the API key. Also, um, optionally, uh, we can also give the name of the Galaxy history that it will create. This tool, um, uh, this uh, custom function, um, <clears throat> first of all, it will uh, create a new Galaxy history uh, on, the, on the server specified using the API key. Then it will upload all the data sets specified in, the, in this list. After that, it will, uh, read the entire notebook and create a Python script out of that. And it will again, upload it to Galaxy in, in the newly created history. Now we have uh, the data sets and the history and the script in the history. And uh, then, um, then the tool runs the script on the uploaded data sets and uh, if we have a model inside it that gets trained, then uh, the tool will create uh, a model in ONNX format. And it also creates uh, some other data sets that we will see uh, shortly. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, we can see in this slide, um, let's suppose this is our script, which is uh, four underscore create model Python script. This script uh, we need to run, and this has um, everything uh, for training the model and creating plots and everything. Then we create uh, another script uh, in, a, in, a, in another tab, and then provide uh, all the necessary parameters, for example, the script path and the data set list, and then run this, uh, this run script job uh, function. This uh, internally invokes another tool, and that is a hidden tool. And then <clears throat> it creates uh, the entire history on the right. So it creates, uh, suppose we have given the CT segmentation and uh, the name of the history, and then it creates a uh, history with this name. And then it uploads the data set that we have added, and then uh, the extracted code from this uh, notebook and then uh, the training happens. Uh, let's suppose the training finishes in, in one hour. Then um, after one hour, uh, the train models would be available. So <clears throat> our uh, script can generate uh, multiple train models. For example, uh, in GAN networks, you have different models. Uh, 
a generator model and discriminator model. So it will create a collection here and all the models would be, would be available. Then it creates a saved arrays. Uh, saved arrays are just, uh, if there are uh, uh, global variables that has uh, matrices in it. So it creates uh, different files for these uh, arrays inside uh, one H5 file. And in this script, if you have created lots of uh, different files, and for example, some JSON file or text file for saving some results, then uh, everything would be uh, zipped and present in this data set. This is uh, like the dump, uh, the whatever is present. And uh, so it will just create a dump of all the files. Then these files can be uh, downloaded and further uh, pulled back into the notebook and then further analysis can be performed. The second use case is the product, uh, predicting proteins uh, 3D structures. So um, <clears throat> uh, we recently read about AlphaFold2 um, that, that made a breakthrough in the prediction of 3D structures of proteins. But AlphaFold2, um, it's uh, very memory intensive and takes a lot of time to, to predict the 3D structures. Therefore, people have come up with uh, smarter solutions, uh, which takes less time and memory and uh, produces uh, structures uh, <clears throat> at the same accuracy what, uh, at what AlphaFold2 would do. So one such uh, technique uh, is ColaFold. So they recently got published in Nature as well. So uh, they are less in intensive than AlphaFold2 and uh, it's, it's quite fast in the paper. They claim that they are 40 to 50 times faster in predicting the 3D structures, but uh, they use alpha fold two weights to do that. Um, <clears throat> so they have optimized uh, the, the homology uh, sequence searches uh, and uh, that takes a lot of time uh, by uh, many against many sequence searching and that reduces lots of time. Um, <clears throat> so to pull this package into our infrastructure, we needed to add only two packages, uh, ColaFold itself and uh, JAX. JAX is just like uh, a Google's version of NumPy. It's just used for matrix multiplications. And some people say uh, it will, it will, it will overtake TensorFlow uh, somehow in future, or it will replace TensorFlow in future. So uh, since our infrastructure uses GPU, therefore the prediction of the 3D structures is, um, is quite fast uh, on, on, our, on our infrastructure. So <clears throat> the Cola Fold people, um, they have created um, different notebooks, um, Colab notebooks uh, for, for showcasing their, their software. So uh, we have adapted one of the um, notebooks and uh, this is available here. And in this notebook, uh, they, it uses ColaFold and AlphaFold2 weights and predict the 3D structures of, of protein. Uh, I tried to predict uh, a 3D structure of a protein. Uh, this is a spike protein uh, of SARS-CoV-2 virus. This is around 300, uh, 300 amino acids long. And this is what it predicted. Um, <clears throat> so we have a running instance uh, in, in Galaxy. Uh, this entire infrastructure is running. Uh, I can show that to you. And also we have created a, a Galaxy training network tutorial that showcases uh, how, to, how to run this uh, infrastructure. And there are lots of features and how to reproduce uh, the results from the two publications that uh, we discussed briefly. Um, yeah. Uh, so uh, this is the running instance um, <clears throat> inside uh, Galaxy Europe. And then we see uh, this is the homepage and it showcases uh, lots of features uh, in the notebook. And there are others, other notebooks, for example, how to share uh, machine learning and deep learning models for scikit-learn and TensorFlow. Um, <clears throat> Then here we see uh, this is the, the grid integration. So we can initialize a clone a repository here. We can 
type the name and everything. So the tutorial already explains um, uh, the, the technique, how to do that. And we have uh, a GPU uh, monitoring dashboards, uh, how much the GPU is being used. And if we run a neural network training using TensorFlow, then we see uh, our GPU is being utilized. Um, I think uh, that's all from my side. Uh, so if there are questions, so I'd be happy to take. This is a really amazing resource. I'm wondering, is this uh, actively in production now that we could go play with it? Uh, so this is available in Galaxy Europe. Um, so we have the tutorial there uh, inside statistics folder, and it explains um, all the different steps uh, needed to, to run this infrastructure awesome. and to open the Jupyter lab. Um, so the tutorial, I can show that, I guess. Um, <clears throat> so if, um, if we go under statistics and machine learning in the Galaxy training network, so this is uh, the tutorial available and it explains uh, different, uh, different features and uh, how, to, how to open this Jupyter lab and how to clone a repository and then how to run. Uh, so for these two papers that I have discussed, uh, these two papers, so there are modified uh, notebooks available and that can be cloned from this repository and then they can be used uh, to, to get such results. And of course, uh, a different, uh, different projects can also be different uh, neural networks can also be developed and uh, trained. Very cool, very cool. And then kind of a related question is, um, I mean, BioBlend is really useful to sort of programmatically, you know, manage files, histories, and launch jobs and whatnot. And you can say no, but I'm wondering if there's a way to kind of expose some of that functionality through a GUI, right? If you wanted to kind of explore, you know, files or histories and just sort of pick, you know, which ones you want. Is there any sort of capability for anything like that? Um, I don't know. So currently, we do not have that. I mean, what I understood, uh, you asked that the Galaxy's history should be available as a GUI in the notebook. Yeah, just some sort of widget, right? You know, it's, you know, you're working interactively, you know, you've run a workflow in Galaxy, it's created, I don't know, 100 output files. And, you know, sometimes, you know, it may be easy to sort of identify the right one, but sometimes it's useful to kind of be able to view. I'm, I'm just wondering, I mean, maybe the right thing to do is just sort of pop back into the Galaxy UI um, and then, um, you know, identify it there. But I'm wondering if there's a way to kind of just make that transition as, as seamless as possible. So if I can jump in here real quick, actually. So there is a, an, another project ongoing called uh, GIN or Galaxy and Notebooks, which the goal of this is to provide a graphical interface inside of Jupyter Lab to Galaxy itself. Oh, cool. Um, and so it, it, it enables us to run tools, upload files and so forth. It does not yet support workflows, but obviously that's on the roadmap, but you can run tools, you can run tools at multiple galaxy instances, um, you know, send files from one galaxy to a different galaxy and, and so forth, um, all using just point and click. Ah, uh, super cool, super cool. So yeah, it would be good to integrate all these together. So I guess that's another question, right? So, so obviously Jupyter Lab is a very popular um, sort of notebook um, and I can see a lot of different variants growing. And so what's the, do you have any thoughts on what's the best way to, to handle this as like, I, I can see, I could take your stack and I'm like, I wanna add a few more things on top of that. So now this is, a, this is another variant of the same notebook that maybe it has, it has the, the gin in it, or maybe it has Kiskit, or maybe it has some other, other tools and so forth, right? So but any thoughts about how we, we stop like massive, potentially non-necessary proliferation of, of these sorts of multiple notebooks? Any thoughts? Um, so we have not yet thought about having a UI inside it, uh, but uh, it could be cool to actually uh, converge these two projects. I mean, 
So we didn't think about having a UI inside. So uh, we want yeah, to- Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's a standard Jupyter extension. So I imagine you just install both packages at the same time, right? But 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 then that becomes like, is that that's another Jupyter notebook, right? Or or someone wants to add their own stuff on top and, and make it sort of exchangeable, right? So uh -huh. it, it might be nice to sort of think about ways to have like a base set of notebooks, but then also provide additional inputs that so that each time you run the notebook, you don't necessarily have to install a bunch of new packages, but you can just pull packages from like a shared data set or something like this. I don't know, some more, more stuff to think about. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, no, it's very cool. Uh, with the, the the GPU utilization stuff, is that like node wise, or does that only show you the user for your specific usage? Uh, it's for user. the yeah, it's for the user specific. So um, so the entire VM is uh, kind of result for this uh, infrastructure uh, when the session starts. So how much GPU is being used? I mean, a user can also type uh, NVIDIA uh, uh, SMI command and then already see that, but it's available via um, a dashboard. So but is... yeah, I guess the, the question is, is, is if two people are running notebooks, do you only see your usage or do you see the combined usage? Uh, so when I start a session, so the entire GPU is for myself. So this GPU okay. will not be used by someone else. So uh, this is currently not possible. So, uh, so one, G, one, one GPU is, is reserved for that one user. So that, you, that is not shared. Can you reserve more than one per user? Or is that configurable or? Uh, that's actually hard. <laughs> so um, currently, um, yeah, TensorFlow does not provide a, a clear way to, to actually do that. Also, it's not, um, for example, um, the GPU has uh, currently what we have. So it has 15 or 16 gigabytes of, of, of memory. Uh, then we are not sure uh, how much uh, one user can use. Uh, if we, so TensorFlow provides a way to, to reserve a part of that. For example, we can specify, okay, uh, I need to reserve for this model only five gigabytes. So I can do that uh, for that user. But if it grows more than that, then it starts producing error and that's, that's not convenient from TensorFlow side. So that is kind of a limitation. So, so the, the reservation happens at the TensorFlow level, not the Docker container execution level? Yes, so it can happen only at the TensorFlow level, yeah. Okay, no, that, that's fine. Because there, there are some other tools that you might want to run that can make use of multiple GPUs, right? Um, mm -hmm. For example, like Gromax and, and so forth, right? So I, I was just sort of thinking if there's anything that could be reused in these cases as well. But mm -hmm. yeah. no, it's very cool stuff. Absolutely. Thanks. Are there other questions? Then I have maybe one, maybe also more for the audience <laughs> as for Anoop. Um, so the big elephant in the room here is security. So, I mean, we, we, we do this project because we still think it's super powerful. And if we can, I mean, if we would be able to give everyone this infrastructure, right, you, you can, I'm, you you have really an accessible GPU infrastructure um, that you can use for playing around with small models, but then in the same environment also outsource it um, to the job scheduler and, and run it for days. And I, and I think it's super useful. The, the problem here is um, if you enable that, you will have pretty, I mean, if you enable that for everyone without any control, you will have a um, Bitcoin miner tomorrow. Um, we have seen that with normal um, notebooks already, so not GPU ones, uh, so that people create 10 accounts and create them um, and, and let 10 notebooks run um, just uh, Bitcoin mining on CPUs. And of course, this will be even, even worse if we enable that for GPUs. So the question is kind of, 
do we have a model for all these advanced ITs and in particular for the GPU enabled ones? Um, yeah, to control users, to block users. Um, and this is a broader discussion that we might want to take either way. Um, we don't have a good solution currently. I mean, what we do is more or less people need to register with an academic address and, and really need to ask us to write us and then we enable it for this account so that we have some I mean, personal contacts that, that there is some reliable person on the other end. Um, but of course, this is not super accessible for everyone, right? You, you need to go through this bottleneck of writing us. Um, but yeah, it's a trade-off and, and maybe you have better ideas. Maybe we should discuss it. Um, we would be very much like to hear your ideas or your concerns here. I guess uh, the other infrastructures, they just limit uh, for hours. For example, Colab, uh, you can run only for 12 hours a session. So, which is like a very simple way to do that, to restrict uh, abuse, I would say. But um, I mean, we do not do that. I mean, we do not put a cap on, on the usage time. So, yeah. I mean, it seems like if it starts to become abused, then we'll have to put in limits, right? Yeah, but if you put in limits for everyone, then the service is maybe not so useful anymore, right? Um, maybe you want to train your model over two days. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that's. Um, I think that's the tension of uh, yeah. providing infrastructure like this, right? Yeah. Nate, I don't know if you can talk, but in general, uh, is there anything that we need to do to uh, uh, .org to enable some of that at least? Because I, I'm not sure what the future is. Are we basically waiting for them to enable cluster for us? Or... If you can talk, that's fine. Just we'll talk at GCC. We cannot hear you, Nate, if that if you're trying to talk. Blink twice. <laughs> it's okay. Like you're probably in a car or something. No, I'm here. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So um yeah, it's a, it's it's sort of a race, right? So um there is a Kubernetes cluster that we currently submit our notebooks to that's broken. Um and they have a new production one that they're going to be putting that, that's not ready yet. Um, so if that's ready before we can come up with an alternative solution, um, then we can do that. We have a lot of Jetstream 2 credits uh, essentially that we can use, um, but we don't have uh, an easy way, an existing way to deploy to that. So we can set something up for it. Uh, but it'll take a little bit of work. So um, whichever one of those two things, you know, sort of happens first, will allow us then to run it. Um, we have GPUs on on Jetstream 2 as well, which is a nice benefit that we probably won't get out of the TAC cluster. Well, because the Anoops case is kind of extreme, but it's just, I mean, it's the extreme and of Jupyter usage, but some just simplest possible things. It's just so nice to have it working. Anyway, perhaps after GCC, we need to have a firm roadmap for this. Yeah, thank you, Anna, for that very exciting talk. Um, are there any other questions? If not, um, the next community call uh, is going to be on August 4th. So I think that's in four weeks since in two weeks, we'll 
have GCC. Um, and uh, just in sharing that the September 1st slot is free. So if anyone's interested, um, let me uh, know and then we can get you signed up. Um, but thanks everybody for joining and uh, see you in four weeks or sooner. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, bye.